Now, you guys are very fortunate. Um, Darren Morris, he is uh, currently running the Gold Coast offices at Bell Partners. Uh, most of you uh, with an interest in this uh, property business are aware of Bell Partners. Uh, he's been with them for eight years. Uh, he's been in Sydney and he's now up uh, on the Gold Coast, but does spend a lot of time coming down here. So he's still going to be very useful for you in the future as a... As a Postgraduates. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he's uh, he's got three daughters under the age of five, so he knows how to deal with stress. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he can handle anything. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Darren Morris. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, whilst I saw all those yellow flags in the air, who's ready for some riveting tax? <laughs> mm. I think I think you need your red flags out for that one. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I do run the Gold Coast office um, for Bell Partners, but we do actually have a Sydney head office, so I'm regularly down in our Sydney office uh, servicing the, the students uh, through Cherie. Uh, so I'm down every once or twice, probably a month. Um, so don't be alarmed if you think that the Gold Coast is too far away. Uh, Skype, emails, telephone calls and face-to-face -face meetings I'm happy to do, so um, I'm happy to help you out wherever I can. Just given that the time constraints, and I don't want to eat into your eating time, um, if we could try to limit the questions during the sessions, I will be saying around during lunch, so if you've got a chance in between eating to come and ask me any questions, by all means, please hound me. Um, if you don't get a chance to talk to me, uh, I do have my business cards at the back as well, so the girls will be able to pass it on to you for you. Thank okay. you. So today's session is primarily going to be how do we set up our business structures once we take this as a, a serious business? Um, and try to get ourselves out of the day-to-day -day salary and wage earners and becoming business owners as such. So, the, as an overview, what we'll be looking at is the applicable taxes that you're going to come across as either a company and or a trust, the types of strategies, the, obviously they've been the owner-occupier, buy and sell, buy and rent. Then probably the most important one is the asset protection aspects of how, how we structure the business. So I'll go through that in a bit more detail. That's what the most appropriate structures would be for that. Then that then flows on through to how do we minimise our tax in the most effective way. Um, I'll go through some GST example as well. Uh, and at the end of it, I'll go through a whiteboard example uh, to, to illustrate to you exactly how we can have the, the tax minimisation from an individual or a sole trader or partnership as opposed to a company and also through a trust. Okay, so to start off with the applicable taxes that everyone's going to come across, we've got a list of nine there, probably the income tax, goods and services tax or GST, capital gains tax is really only going to be a, uh, an issue or a, um, an implication for those that renovate and hold. Uh, what I mean by that is that you will still have to pay the capital gains tax or profits if you're in the business of doing it. However, if you're doing the strategy of the buy, renovate and hold, and you hold the property for more than 12 months, you can actually get a 50% discount if it's held either in your own name or as a trust. And I'll go through it in a bit more detail. Um, so the, the, um, a lot of the students from the past have got a little bit confused when I say that there's no capital gains tax issues for those that flip. It's not deemed to come under the capital gains regime. You are still paying tax on your profits, but you just aren't eligible for the 50% discount because you're not holding it for investment purposes. I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, quickly go through a, a margin scheme. Is anyone familiar with the GST margin scheme? Okay, so not many. So I'll go through that because it's, it's largely um, unknown by a lot of people, um, but it can save you some significant GST when you go to sell. And I'll quickly go through the state land taxes uh, and stamp duty implications. So I won't dwell too much on income tax. Everyone knows what it is. Everyone knows they have to pay it. Uh, for a business, though, it's still the same thing as an individual. You will get assessed on your business income for the 12-month period ended 30 June. The tax rate is going to vary depending on what structure you've got, either a company, a trust, or an individual. The thing with a trust is a trust, if it operates a business or if it is the property owner, the trust itself doesn't pay the tax. It still has to lodge an annual tax return. However, it's the beneficiaries that you flow through the income to. They're the people that actually pay the tax, not the trust itself. 
you can't accumulate income or you can't make a profit in a trust and not distribute it out. Otherwise, you will then get taxed at 46.5% through the trust. So uh, it's pointless to even contemplate that. Capital gains tax is going to be for the buy, renovate and hold uh, strategies. So it's not, it's not a, there's no concessions available for those that are going to be doing the flipping because you're going to be Buy, buy and selling within that 12 month period on each property, therefore you don't get the access to the 50% discount. The discount will only be applicable for individuals and trusts. So if you go and buy an investment property in a company name, that would be the most unrecommended way of doing it because the company won't get a 50% discount. It will just pay a flat 30% corporate tax rate as opposed to a trust or an individual that is entitled to the discount, you can halve your profit and then stream that through to your beneficiaries. Then effectively the maximum tax that anyone would pay is 50% of the top margin rate of 46, so it's 23.25%. So you're clearly 6.75% you're better off than holding it in a company. The date time is also very important too. It says more than 12 months. Assuming you buy a property on 1st of July 2011, and then you go and sell, you want to have that 12 month ownership period, it's important not to sell it on the 1st of July 2012. You would have to do it at least on the 2nd of July 2012. It has to be at least one or at least 12 months in one day. So it's probably unlikely that it would ever happen, but you don't want to get yourself in that situation by selling one day early. Uh, and for capital gains tax purposes, the applicable date is the contract date, not the settlement date. Okay, GST. GST is going to be applicable for our companies that we set up. We're our project management entity, and I'll go through the structure of the project management company. Uh, it'll be applicable on all the goods and services that you buy. So if you're receiving invoices from builders and suppliers, you'll be able to claim a credit on that. When you raise a project management fee from your project management company across to your holding trust, that the money that comes back as payment of that invoice will actually be deemed to be income. So the project management company, which I'll go through uh, in a couple of slides, is effectively a break-even vehicle for tax purposes. If you're going to be doing substantial renovations, now the tax office deems a substantial renovation is where all or substantially all of the, the building is removed or replaced. So it is a grey area and it's a case-by-case -case basis with the tax office as to how they deem a, a substantial renovation. If they do prove to be a substantial renovation, then on your sale, you have to incorporate 1 11th GST or 10% GST on your sale price has to be paid to the tax office. And so I'll go through a, an example with the GST margin scheme of how we can actually mitigate that and, and reduce that as much as possible. So effectively, if you were to buy an old rundown house, you knock it down and rebuild, the tax office would see that as a new residential premise and therefore you would be subject to GST on the eventual sale. If, for instance, you buy a two-bedroom uh, house and you might upgrade it to a four-bedroom but don't touch the bathroom or the kitchen, you could argue that that's not a substantial renovation because all of the building hasn't been replaced or upgraded. So that's where it's a, uh, an individual case-by-case -case basis. And it's always good that you, you speak to your advisors before you go ahead and do that structural renovation, just to make sure that you aren't going to cross any boundaries there. So just as a quick example, if you were to do a, a substantial renovation as deemed to be new residential premises, if you sell the property for $990,000, potentially you would have to allocate that 90,000 GST component or you otherwise take it off the top and build that into your feasibility. So it's important that when you're doing your feasibilities, and you're going to be doing a, a substantial renovation, that there is a GST component worked into that, into that feasibility. Uh, substantial renovations effectively is a GST. Uh, it's just, it comes under the GST provisions. It won't apply to your principal place of residence. So any owner occupiers that are going to be doing it, you'll be exempt from these GST issues. Okay, okay there's an article in there from the Sydney Morning Herald that explains that a bit further with the, currently with the tax office are cracking down on builders and developers. Uh, so it's something that you really do have to, 
dot your I's and cross your T's that you're not trying to be seen to be avoiding tax in any way from the tax office. So I mentioned the GST margin scheme. Uh, how that effectively works is rather than where we had that 990,000 sale price and we had to effectively pay 90,000 back, back to the tax office, if we were to apply the margin scheme, it's only on the margin. So potentially if you've bought, it's the difference between your purchase price and what you sell it for, you only pay 1 11th as opposed to 1 11th on the total sale price. So that's where you can get the significant GST savings. It's important though that it must be stated on both contracts, on your sale contract when you eventually sell it, plus the incoming purchaser. Usually, in most cases, you're going to be selling to a, a mum and dad that aren't registered for GST. So for them, they're just paying market value. They don't care. They don't get any credits for GST. So it's not an issue for them. But for you as the business uh, that's selling the property that's registered for GST, you want to be able to minimise the amount of GST that you have to actually pay in the tax office. So on contracts, There'll be a clause in there, are you applying the margin scheme? You just need to make sure that both solicitors on both sides have actually ticked that for both the purchase and sale contract on your sale. So as an example, let's assume that we buy a block of land for 220000 from uh, just a general mum and dad that uh, sold, the, sold the house that aren't registered for GST. Um, you spend $1,100 in legals, $7,000 stamp duty, and 330 in your development costs. It's important to note that you don't get to claim or add the legal fees, stamp duty and construction costs to your purchase price of 220 when you're calculating the margin. It's only on your actual purchase price being the 220,000 and then what you eventually sell it for being the 880,000. So if you weren't, if we didn't apply the margin scheme, we'd effectively be up for approximately $80,000 payable to the tax office. Under the margin scheme, it's the difference between the 880 and the 220, therefore we've managed to save $20,000 in GST. Any yellow flags on that one? No? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is quite significant. You've got to work that. That, that could be a money for the next deposit to build onto the next property. So you've got to take those sort of um, savings into account. Now, I'll just go back to that. With the, the legal fees and the construction costs, because you're registered for GST, you're able to claim the credits on that in each quarter and that you actually incur them when you lodge your business activity statement. So there's $1,000 of legal fees when paid and the $30,000 of construction costs, which you'll get back as a GST credit on your business activity statement. Okay. Uh, stamp duty, obviously, is going to be applicable on the purchase or transfer of a property based on the purchase price. Unfortunately, we can't avoid this duty. The, the GST that was introduced back in 2000, the whole purpose of that was to eliminate the stamp duty. Um, but in the government's wisdom, uh, they've kept it here and I dare say they're going to keep it here for, until we're dead and buried. It does differ on a state-to-state -state basis. Uh, generally, stamp duty is always going to be payable upon settlement or 90 days from the exchange of a contract. There are circumstances where you can actually arrange with the solicitors for an, uh, a delayed settlement, um, and that just has to be negotiated with them. So, for the majority of you here, obviously, are from New South Wales. I've given you a, uh, a little table there of the applicable stamp duty rates. There was a little footnote that I put in there, which related prior to the latest election down here. Uh, the O'Farrell government is actually going to waive that additional registration charge. And I think that's um, from 1st of July 2011. So it won't apply for any more of those purchases over $500,000. So I've also got the tables there for the other states. Uh, I won't delve into that too much. That's just for your reference. I'll just take a question. Yep. Um, I have a property in Queensland, but I live in South Australia. So how does the stamp duty rate, where does that come in? It's where the land is held. Right, so not where the person lives. No, no. So okay. it's it, because your, your land tax is applicable um, based on a state-by-state -state basis. So you, if you have a property in each state, um, assuming you've gone past your thresholds, you should effectively have a, an assessment from each state government for that property. So what do you mean by thresholds? I don't 
Well, in some state, oh, well, I'll go through the land tax in a couple of slides. There are thresholds, value thresholds, if you've um, got properties in different states. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll explain to that a bit further there. Thank yeah. you. Uh, stamp duty on mortgages, that's been abolished countrywide apart from New South Wales, unfortunately. That was due to be abolished back in 2009, um, but unfortunately they continue that on. They are set to abolish it on the 1st of July 2012. So still another 12 months, theoretically, <coughs> before that gets waived. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it does continue on a bit further, unfortunately. Okay. So for those in New South Wales that are potentially subject to that, um, I've given you another table there as to how much stamp duty on mortgage it would cost. And the, the stamp duty is based on the value of your mortgage, obviously. Okay, so just to answer your question before, the land tax implications are based state by state. So if you have a look at that table there, for individuals, so for instance, if you were, you're in South Australia living in Queensland, your principal place of residence is always exempt. You don't pay land tax regardless of where that is. Investment properties, though, come under these thresholds. So, and it's based on the value per state. So you will get a land tax assessment from New South Wales Office of State Revenue, Queensland Office of State Revenue, if you had those properties in that land. So in Queensland, there is a $600,000 threshold for individuals. So until such time that you're land values in, of all your Queensland properties, aggregated, go over that, you shouldn't have to pay land tax. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't apply with land held by companies or trusts. It does in Queensland. There is a $350,000 threshold for properties that are held in trust, but in all other states, uh, there's a zero threshold for, for land held by trusts. It's on the unimproved land value. That's how the, at each, each year, you'll see there there's the, uh, the cut-off states. It's usually 31st of December for most states, 30 June in Queensland. They will base it on the unimproved land value as of midnight that date. So any land that is held as of 31 December will, will be, if it's applicable for land tax, will be issued to you by an assessment. So Sri mentioned before, it's best to update the Office of State Revenue when you do sell. Um, or if upon settlement, when you go to transfer the property, you can do a land tax adjustment and it'll be worked out by the solicitors and settled in that respect. The premium property tax, uh, unfortunately, once again, only applies for New South Wales. Um, and that's where your, the value of your land uh, is more than 2.3 million. So at this stage, probably won't be too many in the room that will have to pay this tax, but hopefully in a couple of years down the track, we are talking those sort of numbers. Um, and like, likewise, I don't see that ever being abolished. Um, it's just another revenue raiser for the government. Okay, so that's the, the majority of the taxes. What I'll then go into now um, is the different types. I'll briefly go into the, um, the renovation strategies. The owner occupies, uh, renovate and hold, renovate and sell. So we all know what the purpose is of those, so I won't delve too much into that. Owner occupiers. It's exactly that. It's your principal place of residence, therefore there's no tax implications across the board, no GST, no capital gains tax, no income tax when you sell. The issue though, having doing that, is that you don't have the asset protection if you're doing work on your own property because it is in your own name, and therefore any other assets in your own name are potentially exposed. I've got there mentioned there that you can't keep buying and selling um, as your principal place of residence. The tax office will quickly realise that there's a pattern going on that you're avoiding the tax in that respect uh, and they will come down quite heavily. So the general rule of thumb, you could probably get away with it with the first one or the second one. It's where you're flipping them and you've got effectively two or three principal place of residence in one year. The tax office are going to find that highly unlikely that that was ever your intention to hold the first one or the second one as your principal place of residence. There are circumstances where it may be legitimate that you had every intention of living there Whatever happens, you might have noisy neighbours and you decide to move out after three months. That's fair enough. The tax office really can't argue against that. It's only where they start seeing a pattern of this happening that they're going to, they're going to get... And they have access to all the, the other state government departments and the federal government departments, land, land, land titles office. So they are investing a lot of money to try to crack down on this 
tax avoidance, uh, so to speak, uh, with, with that strategy. For those that want to renovate and hold, any of the income that you receive from your rent will be assessable income, but then likewise all your associated costs of renting that property, the agent's fees, repairs and maintenance, insurances, rates, etc., they will become tax deductible. As it's a buy and hold strategy, and it's likely that you would be holding it for more than 12 months, you would be eligible for the 50% capital gains tax discount. There is potential for the GST to come into a play, particularly if you've done a, you've claimed some credits for all your costs and you've done a substantial renovation, they may want to charge GST on your end sale. The one way around that, if it's feasible, is that even if you've done a structural renovation or substantial renovation and there was potential GST that has to be applied, if you rent that out for the next five years, the tax office can't come after you for the GST. So it might be a situation where you've done a substantial renovation and you want to hold it because you're getting great rent. If it's feasible to do that, for hold it for five years, you can then sell that after year five and effectively not pay any GST. So you pocket that GST component. For those that are going to be registered for GST or are going to be doing multiple structural renovations, uh, you'd want to be registered for GST. Land tax will be... A will be assessed on you based on the land held in that entity, be it a individual or a trust. For those that are going to be doing the buy and hold, usually you're going to have negative gearing with a buy and hold strategy. There's, there's options of structuring. Do we do it as an individual, as a company, or as a trust? First of all, I wipe out a company where you're going to be doing a buy and hold because you won't get the CGT discount. I then look at what's the benefit between an individual and a trust. The benefit of a trust is primarily asset protection and the ability to be able to stream through income. The one downside of a trust is that where you've got gearing and you've got losses in a trust, you're unable to distribute out your losses to your beneficiaries so they can use against their personal tax return. So effectively they get quarantined or carried forward in your trust until such time down the track, either the following year or the year after that, when you eventually sell any capital gain can be offset by those carry forward losses. So if you're objective is to get the tax benefits today, then it might be better to actually hold the property in your personal name so that you can reduce your personal taxable income. If that's not a priority to get the tax benefits in the present and you're happy to recoup them at a later date, then I'd still go with the trust structure, mainly for asset protection and I'll go, th I'll go through the reasons why soon. Now most of us here are going to be doing the, the flipping of the properties or the buy, renovate and sell. So in this respect, for income tax purposes, we're going to be taxed on our net profits, which is, in simple terms, whatever our sale proceeds are, excluding GST. So it's important to note that GST and income tax are two separate taxes. You, you don't need to declare the GST inclusive value on your tax return. It's always the GST exclusive values. And likewise, with all your purchase price and your renovating costs, you're only including the GST exclusive value on your income tax return, the GST credits or GST amounts get lodged via the business activity statement. So depending on what type of structure you've got, you'll get taxed on your net profits, be it at a corporate rate or if it's via a trust, whoever it's flowed through to at the end of the year to the beneficiaries will pay their marginal tax rate on their specific uh, distribution. <coughs> now I mentioned here there's no CGT discounts available as usually in most cases where you're flipping, you're gonna be flipping them within the 12 month period. Therefore, there's no entitlement to the concession. So you're still paying capital gains tax, but it's, it's not deemed to be a capital gain event when you're in the business of flipping because you're doing that as your trading profits, not investment profits. GST, we're in the business of flipping. We must be registered for GST and we wanna be able to try to claim back as much as we can from the tax office from the invoices that we have to pay to our, to our third party. So it's important that we are registered for GST. Likewise, the substantial renovations tax may be applicable where we've done those um, significant renovations to, to the property. Land tax, once again, is the same as the, the renovate and hold strategy. It's whatever land that you do hold at 31 December or 30 June for Queenslanders, uh, you will be potentially subject to the tax if you go over those thresholds. And in terms of the business structures, you definitely want to have a company and or trust set up for that. And I'll go through why exactly we want to do that. 
So I've just given you a quick summary there. Um, it will vary on a case-to-case -case basis, so this won't be just a, a cookie-cutter approach to this. won't apply to everyone in every aspect, but this is just a general overview. Okay, so probably the, the important part of today's session is the purpose of having the business structures in place and why they're important. First and foremost, asset protection should always be our number one priority over our tax minimisation or anything like that. At the end of the day, we want to be able to protect our family home and our, value, our family assets. We don't want a situation where someone can have access or make a legal claim against those valuable assets and potentially we, they get repossessed or we have to sell. So it's a worst case scenario, but we need to, need to make sure that from day one we are structured right and we're, and we're structured right for, for your individual purposes. It's not always going to be the same situation for everyone and that's why it's important that you do... When, when, usually when I sit down with the students um, or speak with them that we actually outline exactly what their current position is, what their intentions and objectives are, what their family situation is, their income situation, and then, then we can work out what's the most appropriate. So asset protection is purely just to mitigate our risk of anything happening to our personal assets. And the safest way and the most effective way for asset protection is a trust structure. Um, there's many forms of trust. Uh, you've probably heard of discretionary trust, family trust, unit trust, hybrid trust, property trust, class trust. I won't go into that because it's a whole another week of explanations there. But for everyone in the room, um, this is a show of hands. Does everyone already have their own discretionary trust? So quite a few of you. So, um, so a lot of you have already been hopefully given the advice. Does that, out of those that already have their discretionary trust, are you all fully under, understanding of why you've got a trust and then how it's all meant to be? Okay, so that's good. Okay, with tax minimisation, we don't want to avoid the tax. We don't want to put dodgy tax deductions just to get around the tax. It's ways of legally being able to reduce our tax. Um, I'll go through in the whiteboard example um, some changes that's come down on Tuesday's budget, which for me as accountant is an absolute nightmare. Um, but that just makes our job now to try to find some other loopholes to, to get around that uh, and minimise the taxes. Okay. When buying the property, when you're in the business of that, try avoid buying it in your personal name unless you're going to be holding it as your principal place of residence because you obviously want to get the main residence tax exemptions by having it in your personal name. It's where you're going to be doing the, the flipping is that you want to hold that effectively in a trust structure. Okay. Um, having it as an individual or partnership, a partnership itself is really not that effective where it's two individuals as partners because effectively the liability rests on the partners. So if it's you individually, mum and dad as partnership, effectively mum and dad are still individually liable. There are situations where it's a little bit more complex, but if you had a partnership of discretionary trusts, that would be more effective for capital gains tax minimisation. Uh, but that's generally used more in, in business situations rather than with property. It can be a little bit more complex and costly to set that structure up, but as part of our overall approach to working out the best structure, particularly if you, you might be going into business or wanting to do joint ventures, um, a partnership of trusts can sometimes work, um, either that or a unit trust scenario. Now, with companies or proprietary limited companies, this gives us much greater asset protection than as an individual. However, it's not as effective as a, a trust itself. Uh, in an ideal world with a company to set that up, we would want the director of that company to not hold the family home in their own name. So in 99% of cases, most people um, as a couple, or boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, go out and buy their property in, in joint names without the forward thought that they might want to go into business some, at some stage and start up a business. By having, the, I guess, the, the foresight to see that you might want to go into business, it would be more appropriate to have either, say, one party, being, let's say, the mother, have the title of the property in her name. Therefore, when you go to set up your company, you would have the father or the male as the director and the sole director. So well, the reason why you want to do that is so if someone does make a legal claim against your company, 
they make a claim against the company assets. If there's insufficient assets there, they potentially go after then the company director. So we don't want that company director to hold significant assets. So that's why we would have the other spouse owning the family home. So it gives you that asset protection in that respect. There is limited liability with the director of a company. Um, so what that means is that they'll go after the company assets. If there's nothing in there, then they can potentially go after the, the, the actual company director if it's an active business. Company profits are taxed at a flat 30%. So I'll go through that in the illustration. Um, so no matter how much you earn in that company, you're only going to pay a 30% tax. That is expected to decrease down to 29% for small businesses uh, in the 2013 year. So it's still a couple of years off yet. Um, there will be some initial setup fees of these companies to set it up and get it registered with the ASIC. Uh, potentially there will be quarterly GST and BAS statements that have to be lodged. There will have to be an annual set of financial statements and an annual company tax return. Uh, and there's also an annual ASIC registration fee that has to be paid. So that's, they're generally, the, I guess the first initial setup fee is a one-off. The other ones will be ongoing compliance. Now with trusts, trusts are the preferred structure. Um, with a trust, every trust has to have a trustee. So the trust isn't a legal entity itself, it's more of a taxable entity. So every trust either has to have an individual trustee, either, either mum and dad, or you can have a corporate trustee or you set up a company to act as trustee for your trust. I would always recommend that you set up a corporate trustee for asset protection purposes and the reason why because when someone wants to try to make a legal claim against assets in a trust, they can't make a claim against the trust itself because that trust is only holding the assets for the beneficiary's entitlements. So they have to go after the legal trustee. So if you as yourself individually as a legal trustee of your trust, effectively your personal assets are still ex exposed. So if you set up a corporate trustee, now this company shouldn't be active in its own right, it shouldn't trade, it shouldn't have any assets in its name, it just be a, a, a dormant company that you set up with the ASIC. So if someone tries to make the legal claim, they have to make the legal claim against ABC Proprietary Limited as trustee for the ABC Family Trust. That ABC Proprietary Limited has no assets. So effectively they hit a brick wall with their claim. It's only in the situation where you as a director of ABC have been negligent or fraudulent, or you've breached the duty of care as a director, that could be um, trading insolvent, uh, non-lodgement of tax obligations, is there is the potential for them to look through that trustee company and actually potentially go after the directors there. Now in most situations we, we prefer a discretionary family trust, usually because it is um, spouses that go into the business to do this and it gives us a, the flexibility to be able to distribute within our direct family group. It also includes other family companies and other family trusts that might already be set up. So we, we may be able to stream through the profits from our property trust. We may have another business or other sources of income held in a company that might, might have had carry forward losses. We're able to distribute through to those other associated companies legally without having to pay any tax. We use up the losses in that other entity or we distribute, out, distribute down through to other low income earners. So it's the beneficiaries, either the individuals or the company that receives the trust distributions, they have to declare that distribution. It's not the trust itself. So I'll go through in the whiteboard example exactly what I mean by that. In most situations, the beneficiaries of a trust are gonna be the husband and wife or spouses, the children, grandchildren, uh, immediate relatives like sisters and brothers, can be nieces, nephews. The only issue with that is that once you start to distribute to nieces and nephews and those outside of the direct family, it can create family tax payment issues if the other side of the family are receiving those sort of payments. Plus it also does raise a, a legal liability to that beneficiary. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in the, in the uh, example. So it is important that if whoever you are going to distribute to at the year end, which you would do in consultation with the accountant, will tell you the most effective way of distributing that out. If you're going to be distributing to parents, potentially that might be receiving an age pension or other government pension, 
please be aware that they have to then include that on top of their pension income, which could adversely affect their pension entitlements. Um, so you need to take into account that either there'll be a sweetheart deal that you arrange to pay the, the shortfall um, if that gives you a beneficial tax reduction. Uh, I did that with my parents who unfortunately had to pay a couple hundred dollars more than because um, I distributed more out of my business to them. So as a good son, I, I uh, paid that for them, but it saved me a couple of thousand dollars in tax by doing so. So it was effective for me to do so. So just to give it, I guess, an illustration of what it would look like. So when we go to buy the property, we would buy it under the trust. However, when we set up a trust, or if you've got your trust, we need to have a trustee. So we would always recommend that we set up a proprietary limited company that holds no assets and doesn't trade in its own right. Now the trust will be the taxable entity. So it'll be the one that has the ABN and tax file number. This trustee company won't have an ABN or tax file number. I purposely don't, you can set one up if you like, but what I've found in the past is that by doing that, it creates lodgement compliance issues with the tax office. So if we do not even worry about a tax file number or an ABN with that trustee company, we can eliminate having to do that additional compliance. So it's only gonna be the trust that'll be the taxable entity. So any profits at the end of each year can get distributed out to the beneficiaries and then the beneficiaries pay the tax at their marginal rates. So with the, the legal trustee, um, where we've got situations where there is joint ownership of the family home, it's not going to make too much of an issue who is the director of that trustee company. And Paul from Portfolios will probably go into a bit more detail tomorrow. When you're going to the banks to borrow funds, when you're buying in the trust, we also want to be able to borrow at the trust level as well. Now, the banks aren't going to lend to a newly formed trust because there's no financial history. So in circumstances of that, they're going to want to see director's guarantees. Now, they're going to want to see serviceability of the directors to be able to, to pay the loan. So if you've just got the one director, um, you're limiting your um, ability to be able to get a higher borrowing capacity. So it's best that we have both mum and dad or whoever's party to the agreement to go as the directors because the banks will want to see that the directors are also uh, eligible to be beneficiaries of the trust, and therefore that'll go towards servicing the debt. Yep. Um, with beneficiaries, do they need to be Australian residents? No, they can be non-residents, but if you do distribute to a non-resident for tax purposes, you're going to get taxed at non-resident rates. The trustee will get taxed at non-resident rates. So it doesn't really become that effective, no. So this trust will have its own ABN, its own tax file number. It'll have the borrowings. It'll go on title of the properties. It should also have its own bank account. Because how, how it should work, I'll just go through it. Uh, okay, sorry, before I go on to, with the trading company or our project management company, this is the one that Sheree was referring to before, where you've got that separate company dealing with the public. This is your day-to-day -day running entity. Effectively, this company is doing project management work on behalf of your associated trust who owns the asset. So for tax purposes, I would always recommend that there is a, an invoice or a project management fee paid across from your trust back to your project management company for commerciality purposes, which will satisfy the tax office. Um, so effectively, what happens here is you get issued an invoice from your build or your supplier. They'll issue that to your trading company. Your trading company usually won't have much funds to its name. So what I would recommend you do is you might get an invoice for, say, $5,000 from a builder. You should then raise an invoice from your trading company back to your discretionary trust, which owns the property, for, say, $6,000. Now, it just needs to be a markup of profit because you want to be able to show the tax office that your company is being set up legitimately for a view for a profit. So it's always important that we actually do have that small markup. So the $6,000 will then get drawn down from the borrowings that you've done through the trust. You then transfer that $6,000 from your trust back to your trading company. You pay the supplier $5,000. You keep the $1,000 in the company bank account for use for future project costs. Okay, got a few blue flags now. <laughs> okay. 
Just going back to uh, how you mentioned under the company, being both under the husband and wife name to give you better borrowing capacity, but then keeping in mind what you were saying about if um, their home is in one name, by doing that, aren't you then exposing both? And then is there a way you can set the company directors up as you know, a yeah. percentage of share? Is that doable or you not can really? Do. You can do. In most cases, anyone that's going to make a claim, they're going to make a claim against this, this trading company. Mm. They won't really make a claim against your trust because that's held in isolation owning the property. So the ones performing the works and doing all the project management is this company. So if anything, people are going to try and make a claim against this company. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we've got the appropriate director of that company being the person that doesn't hold the significant assets. Where you've got 50-50 ownership of properties, it's neither here nor neither oh, here nor there. Say in the instance where the family home is under one name. Yes. And then you wanted to put the company name on the other partner's yes. name. Yes. Yep. Okay, so it puts asset yep. protection. Yes. But then, as you said, it takes away that borrowing <laughs> capacity with the banks. Yeah. What would you do in that instance? In that instance, obviously, <laughs> if you don't get the funding, then it falls to pieces. You don't get the, the property. So I think the funding has to be taken into account. You need to. I guess, take a calculated risk in that respect. Mm. There is situations where you can actually have both of you as directors of the trustee company, sorry, of the trustee company for serviceability purposes, and then you can resign yourself, that, or that person, okay. as yeah. a director down yeah. the track. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can yeah, do it that way. Yeah. It might be a little bit more cost just to resign them and lodge all the forms of the ASIC, but, but if that gives you the finance. The finance and then the asset protection down the track as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yep, yep. Right. Okay. Yeah, Teresa, um, going back to the trust and beneficiaries. Now, if I haven't got any beneficiaries, yes. um, can I be my own beneficiaries? Or? Yes, yeah, well, effectively, if it's just yourself, um, sometimes a trust may not be that effective for streaming through income, for income tax purposes. And I'll go by, in the white ball example, it's actually been lessened <laughs> since the, the federal budget with the inability now to distribute through to kids. Uh, but where it's just yourself, I would still encourage having the trust for asset protection purposes. You yourself can be a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. You can utilise your low marginal rates. Mm -hmm. um, you may even want to look at then distributing to your trading company if you want to cap your tax rate at 30% on any of your profits. Because you might have a profit here in your trust. You distribute out to yourself personally because you're the only family member. Mm -hmm. Then we don't want to get you over, preferably over $80,000 personally. Right. because you're then paying 37% tax. So you're better off distributing to an associated company and capping your overall tax at 30% regardless. Right, Does so when would you have access to that? I mean, Ac when you access, say ac access to the trust, I mean... To the money? Yeah. Well, you can take that out effectively as you need. This is more of a tax um, shuffle mm, of yeah. money at the end of the year that we would work out. So we'd work out what your tax profits are and then mm -hmm. distribute that out for tax purposes mm -hmm. and declare that in your, in your tax returns. But in terms of the hard cold cash, you can take that as you, if you've sold the property, you take the cash as you need. We just work around director's loans or wherever, however much you've taken out. Um, it's not too much of an issue. Right. So okay. you can, you, to answer your question, you can access it when you've got it, so okay. to speak. Okay, thank you for that. Are we having two companies here? Are we having a trading company and then a, a that's company? Right. All right. That's right. You've got one yeah. standalone trading company and then you've got your trust with a separate company on top of that, which acts as the trustee. So two okay. companies and a trust is the proposed. Okay, so some of those people that have a trading uh, trust obviously don't have a, a separate company set up, so we need to do that. Yes. Okay, yeah. thank yep. you. That's right. Another one? Yep. Who, who pays the land tax and who pays the company, the capital gains tax? What happens? Whoever the that? owner, so the so title the owner. the trust pays the land tax? The trust will pay. If it owns the land, then it will pay the land tax. So you don't get the first 300 or something? If it's in a trust, whereabouts is it, do you own New land? New South Wales. Yeah, there'll be no threshold. So if it's mm. held in a trust, it's every dollar of unimproved land value. Right. And capital tax. gains, what happens to that? Capital gains tax, if it's held for more than 12 months, yeah, if the trust if the trust it. owns it for more than twelve months, you'll get a fifty yeah. percent. So you might have a gain of two hundred thousand. So you distribute the capital. You only then distribute a hundred thousand of that profit. Okay. Because you get the fifty percent discount for holding it for more than twelve months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so here's the, the flow through, which I mentioned before with that little illustration about where you get issued the invoice. So the suppliers and contractors will issue the invoice to your project management company. Your project management company then raises an invoice to your trust, which holds all the funds for the renovations and for the purchase price with a small markup. So it, it, it can be a percentage, it can be a, a certain amount. Generally, um, you'd probably want to do it once a month, so you might total up all your invoices as opposed to getting 20 invoices in one month and trying to s then pass on 20 invoices to, to your discretionary trust. That'll be a nightmare. So if you just total up all your invoices for that one month or fortnight, whatever the payment terms are, raise it. If you are going to do a percentage markup, just make sure that you're keeping it consistently at that percentage markup. Uh, if the tax officer ever was to review, they'd want to they'd be asking questions as why it's only 1% this month and 20% this month, 0.1% next month. So there's no pattern of um, legitimacy in that respect. If, it was a, if you were working with a third party and you actually had a project management fee, the, you'd have an agreement where you're actually paying a set percentage. So it's important that you do keep that consistent. So, like, yeah, so you've got the bank loans, which will be held in your trust. You then transfer the money back to your project management company. You then pay your invoices to your supplier. You keep the rest in the company bank account and you can use that for future ongoing costs. Okay. Depreciation is really only gonna be beneficial for those doing the renovate and hold. Um, you're really not gonna get the tax write-offs if you're gonna be flipping them because you're only gonna be holding them for a couple of months during the year. Um, it's quite important that you actually do get a, a tax depreciation report by a qualified quantity surveyor if you're going to do the renovate and hold. How many are looking to do the renovate and hold strategy? It's probably only a handful. Um, a tax depreciation report is going to become very helpful for you if it's a relatively newer building. Generally, the write-offs are over a 40-year period. So if you've bought a property back in 19... that was built in 1975, it's pretty much pointless trying to get a depreciation report on that property if you go and buy it for, for long-term investment because you're only going to get about three or four years' worth of remaining write-off. However, there's a term called scrapping, which is where you're intending to do a renovation on that property, and even though it might be an older building, you can do a tax depreciation report prior to the renovation because when you eventually knock it down and rebuild it or do the substantial renovation, you can scrap effectively whatever the written down value or the remaining value of the building costs and claim that as a tax deduction. Then when you do your renovations, you then go do a separate tax depreciation report on the improved value of the building and then that can then go on for, for more years there. So you, you get to a doubling effect of your tax write-offs um, by doing that. So if you do need um, some references to some reputable quantity surveyors, um, just give me an email or call and I'll happily uh, pass that on to you. Is that working? Oh. Yep. Um, what about a situation where it's been a buy, renovate, sell process, a significant renovation, so GST claims have been made, you can't sell it, you've put a tenant in, so it's been on the market for six months. What about depreciation in that case? Once you've made it available for rent, all your costs then become deductible. So you can actually start claiming that. You could do a depreciation report on it, claim that. Um, the issue that you just need to be wary of, if you've gone and claimed all your GST credits... Um, adjustments. The adjustments need to be done with yep. the tax office. Uh, unless you hold it for five years and can rent it for five years, if that's feasible, it may not be, but if you hold it for five years of rental, then effectively you don't pay the GST, you don't have to do an adjustment. I'm on the Gold Coast, I'll be coming to see you. <laughs> One more question. If it's an old property, is, can you do a depreciation schedule then? You can like do. If you, you just start with the value once you've renovated it? You can do that, but you might still be missing. If, if you do the scrapping, do the scrapping report as well. There's, there's probably still do that. Yeah, you yeah. can still do that and, then, and try to write off those minimal costs as well. <coughs> okay, repairs and improvements are, I guess, a bugbear of the tax office. Uh, from their point of view, they want everything to be improvements so that you only depreciate and don't write off in full, whereas we're, from our perspective, we want to try to write off as much as we can to reduce our tax. Generally speaking, repairs are going to be where you've actually 
you're fixing something to put it back to its normal state, so you're fixing a washer or uh, changing a leaking tap, etc. you should be able to write those off. An improvement's going to be more where you have removed the original item and replaced it with a new item. Uh, so typical things are going to be your, your new carpets, your new blinds, new kitchens, etc. which generally they're going to be over $1,000 in costs, uh, therefore they have to be depreciated as such. So there is, is a change coming through with the budget that that 1,000 threshold uh, will increase to $5,000. So any costs up to 5,000, I think it doesn't start until 1 July 2012 though, uh, you should be able to write off everything up to $5,000. So there's, there's a one incentive out of coming out of the budget, uh, but very minimal, for my liking anyway. With the project management fee, is there a standard fee? Like, I know you mentioned it varies, but... As long as it's commercial. Yeah, um, what would be considered commercial? And anywhere between 3 to 20%, I guess. Yep, I gotcha. So in the more profi if you're more a professional PM, then it's further towards... Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. If you're doing this professionally and you're dealing with third parties, you'd yeah. want to be able to make a, a good profit out of your business. So. Obviously, the rate's going to be higher with a, a more formal outfit, but for yourself, even if you do it 5%, that should be fine. Okay, good. And the other is, if you buy, renovate, hold, where you qualify for the 50% discount when you sell, yes. but you're also, in the meantime, buying, renovating and selling, and of course, you're hit with income tax, do, does the ATO discriminate um, between the two according to what yeah. the activity you're doing. We, we've had situations where that, and the tax officers tried to say that, no, it's all trading stock and not investment stock. Yeah. In that situation, what I would generally recommend is that where you know you, you do want to have a hold strategy mm. and, the, and the sell strategy is to have two separate trusts. One being the investment trust, where you have the renovate and hold, yes. and one where you're doing the flipping in a separate trust, so at least we've got them isolated. Right, yeah. good, very good. Yeah. Thanks. You're right. Repairs and improvements, the way I've been understanding it is if you buy the property, it has a tenant, you get rid of them, do the reno, it's called repair. Or you buy a property, there's no tenant, you do the reno, it's improvement. Is that wrong? Yeah, no, it all comes down to is it available for rent. It doesn't have to be tenanted. Right. This has to be available for rent. Because I've just read if you have a tenant there, then do the reno, it becomes like a repair so you can... Tax it off? Yeah, yeah. no, no. Yeah. It, yeah. it depends on the, the nature of the expense. Um, so if, it, if it's an improvement, if you've taken something away, put something brand new, if, if you had old lino as your carpet and you go and rip it up and put in tiled floors, then that's going to be an improvement, not a repair. Yeah, where, where you're fixing something to put it back to its normal state is a repair and you should be able to write that off. Um, but what I did say before where it's available for rent, so all that has to be is you place something on an advert in the, in the paper, a little two-line advert in the paper that's available for rent. You can then still claim all your, your interest costs and all your other running costs for that property whilst you're doing the renovation. And that's mainly for a renovate and hold strategy. Okay. Before I start the example, was there any other questions about that? Yep. Hang on a second. Would you include that loss of rent, like say you've said it's available for rent, X amount of dollars, and then um, you can't get anybody, so you've rented it out? No, no you can't. You can't put that there. You can't claim that figure back, but all your associated costs are going to help you get those rental losses for, for negative gearing purposes, and that'll reduce your personal tax, right. if it's in your personal name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Just labouring the point about repairs and improvements. Um, if you buy something that's empty, and say the vanity in the bathroom is terrible, falling apart, and you replace it, is that a repair or an improvement? It's what, empty. What sort of value are you going to oh, replace it with? Two hundred dollars or something. Oh yeah, you write that off. Yeah. Anything that's under a thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Now I'll go through the whiteboard example now of how we work out the GST and taxable income, and then I'll show it through as an individual and a company and a trust as well, just to show you the, uh, the tax variances there. So in this example, 
Uh, this is assumed that John is a property trader uh, who's in the biz business of renovating and selling. Uh, he's married to Jane. Um, let's assume in this situation she's not working and therefore not receiving any other personal income. Uh, he has three children under the age of 18 that also aren't working or any, earning any other income. He purchases a house and land for $500,000. He incurs substantial renovations of $110,000, including $10,000 of GST. And then he sells the property for $770,000 GST inclusive. Because he's in the business of renovating, in this situation, we'll assume he hasn't applied the margin scheme, just for simplicity. Um, and I'll show you how this all pans out. So the first step is to work out our actual GST implication. Because uh, like I said before, there's two taxes, GST and income tax, and they're both separate. So in this situation, we know he's bought the property for 500000 He's incurred renos of $110,000. We know that it's $10,000 of GST. So therefore, for income tax purposes, we can only claim a deduction of $100,000, not the full $110,000, because out of the $110,000 of costs, We've claimed back by way of the GST returns $10,000. So we've already received that as a credit, so we can't double up and claim the full GST inclusive amount. So that gives us total costs of 600000 We know that he's then gone and sold it for $770,000. So for simplicity, let's assume that it was a GST or taxable supply, therefore he has to pay the 111th GST. He's got to pay $70,000 to the tax office. Therefore, only has to declare $700,000 as income. So we've got costs of $600,000, sales of $700,000. Therefore, we have a profit of $100,000, which has to be declared in the end of year taxes. Is that all clear enough? Yep. Okay. So that's the first step. Next step is that we know that we've got $100,000 as our taxable income. So we start off with a proprietary limited company. That's easy. We know that the company gets taxed at what rate? 30%. Therefore, we're going to be up for potentially a $30,000 tax liability if we had that property under a company. If we had a million dollar profit, it's going to be 300000 So that's fairly straightforward. Okay. Now, this is assuming he was an individual or a sole trader. He's going to, that $100,000 that he made is going to get taxed at his marginal rates. So just quickly... The first $6,000 of income is tax-free. We don't pay any tax on that. From $6,000 to $37,000, our marginal tax rate is 15%. So if we had income of $37,000, we'd have tax to pay of $4,650, which is $31,000 times 15%. The next marginal tax bracket is 37000 to 80000 And at that income, we're paying 30% tax. And that should be 12900 From 80000 to 180000 we pay 37% tax. Anything over 180. dollars we're paying the 45%. Now, I've excluded the 1.5 Medicare levy, uh, just for simplicity purposes. 
just to let you know as well, as a one-off for next year with the natural disasters, anyone earning more than $50,000 a year are going to have to pay another 0.5 on top of their 1.5. So you'll be paying 2% Medicare levy. And anyone earning over $100,000 is going to pay an extra 1%. So you're paying 2.5% Medicare levy for the 2012 year. Don't blame me just because I'm a Queensland and that's where all the natural disasters happened. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Okay, so we know we've got $100,000 that we have to declare. So we know that John is in this 37% bracket. So 100000 less our lower threshold of 80000 is 20000 So $20,000 at 37% is going to be 7400 So if I've added this up right... We should have 24,950 as a personal income tax liability in this scenario. So, sorry, about the same. It's five five thousand dollars less per year. Yeah. So you might look at that and think, well, I'm just better off doing it in my own name. I'll pay less tax. But the thing you've got to take into account is your marginal tax rates. Like I said before, if you made a million dollar profit you're going to be paying 45% on $820,000 of that. So as opposed to the company that gets a flat 30%, you're only going to cap it at the 30% tax rate. Okay. So this stage is we know that we're paying less tax as an individual. The other scenario is with the discretionary trust. Okay, so we know we've got $100,000 and that has to be distributed out to our beneficiaries. Otherwise, if we don't distribute that out, you're going to get taxed $46,500 being the top marginal rate. The trustee will have to pay that if you declare a trust tax return and don't give any beneficiary details of who you've distributed it out to. So in the um, example, we know that he's got three children. Um, for this year only, and ending 30 June 2011, we were allowed to distribute 3,333 tax-free to our children under the age of 18 each. So that's effectively, for three children, you're looking at about $10,000 that you won't pay any tax on. We know that Jane wasn't working and had no personal income, so she would be an eligible beneficiary that we want to distribute through to so that we can use her low marginal rates. So in the example before with the individual, the 15% marginal tax bracket, we could give her $37,000. So at that, we know that she only had a, would only have to pay $4,650 in tax. So we've distributed 10,000 to the kids, 37,000, that's 47. We've still got 53,000 that have to be distributed. So if we were just to give that to John, assuming he has no other income as well, he would have to declare 53,000 in his personal return, get taxed at the marginal rates, which should be 17. What's 16,000 times 30%, 4,800, 9,450. So in total, on $100,000 of taxable income for a trust, distributed through to our beneficiaries, we could reduce our tax down to $14,100. So if you look at that, that's more than $10,000 less than as an individual or a sole trader. So that's where the benefits from a tax minimisation or tax streaming comes in with the trust, that we have the ability to be able to flow that all through. Now there might be situations where you don't have children or you don't have a spouse and it's just yourself. Like I mentioned before, what you would want to do in that situation is you'd want to try to cap yourself at that 80,000 limit where you're not paying any more than 30% tax. So you might have 100,000 that has to be distributed. You only want to distribute 80,000 in your personal return. 
The next best scenario would be to distribute the other 20,000 to an associated company of yours because we know that we only pay a 30% tax rate on distributions to a company. So in that respect, you're effectively utilising it as a company where you're having a flat 30% tax regardless of what you earn, but you've got the asset protection by having it in trust, plus the ability to be able to stream it through. For those of you that potentially are on or are over 55 years of age, another technique or strategy would be to start pumping up your superannuation. You might have a profit of $100,000 in which you could potentially distribute into your super. So if you were both aged over 15 years, super balance is less than 500000 you could effectively wipe that out by putting $50,000 each, that's only applicable if you're over 50, into your super fund. You get a deduction in your trust for that 100000 therefore you've got nothing left to distribute. The only implication with that is that the $100,000 that you put into super will still get taxed at 15% when it goes into the super fund and you may not be able to access it if you're not over 55 years of age. But that's another strategy and technique that I'm happy to go through with anyone in that situation. This working? Yeah. Um, I've already taken out my super because I've retired. Um, can I still put start up another one? Or? How old are you, if you don't 60, mind me asking? 63. That's fine, you can still do that. You can still keep contributing into super up to the age of 75. Right, so that even if I've emptied the account, if, I can put a new one yeah. in. Is it a self-managed super fund? Or it was just the one from work. Okay, yeah. You can, Hester. Yeah, and so are you drawing a, a pension stream out of that? No. No, okay. So it's still in accumulation mode. No, I've, I've taken it out. Okay, so you've spent the... Yeah. Took it out as a lump closed, sum. closed, yeah. Yep. yeah. Are you still working, though? No. Well, effectively, you will be now when you're in business. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. There's potential Great. for you to do that. That's right. Great. Thank you. That's right. I'll just quickly go through with the changes now. Effective 1 July this year, we're still able to distribute to our kids, but the powers that be will only let us do $416 per child. So it's really, it's, it's really annoyed me, the fact that they've done that. Because um, basically, the last 10 years we've been promoting and saying discretionary trusts are great for asset protection and tax minimisation. It's now become a situation where we're left to eat humble pie with all our clients now. They're saying, why did you tell us to do a trust? I mean, but overall, I would always still recommend a trust for asset protection purposes. Um, and it does still give us some flexibility of distributing our income out. It's just, it's less than the, the, less than the whole population growth of Australia, so to speak. You can't utilise them as a tax write-off anymore. Um, so in that situation, rather than $10,000, we would only be able to have $1,248 tax-free. So effectively, John or Jane are going to get taxed at 30% on... What's that? 8, 7, 5, 2... 7, then we've got a calculator. My, my brain's not that quick. 8, 7, 5, 2 times 30%. Two six five five. Two six two five. So you effectively, come 2011-2012 tax year, you'd be up for a, an additional two and a half thousand dollars by virtue of the changes to the to the budget. Now this hasn't been passed as legislation. Um, it's been proposed, but there's been no backflipping or anything by the other political parties. So that's a, a sure sign. Sure, for a sign that it's actually going to go into to legislation. So, my question is about super. That uh, if you put it into super and you're over 55, which I'm not as yet, but you can actually then pull it out and pay 15% tax rather than 30% tax. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So whatever you put into super, yep. your super fund will pay 15% tax. But you're effectively getting because we're distributing out at that 30% level, yep. you're getting a, uh, a deduction at the 30% corporate rate yep. because we're minimising what we have to pay as to, or declare as distributions so it's decreasing because John's in this 30% bracket over yep. 37,000 so if we put in a 15,000 super contribution that'd bring that down to 85,000 we only have to then have 38,000 so it's 
you know, I realise John is, yep. but like if, say, someone's on the pe- or they're over 55, they could actually be doing this and, and putting that 100,000 straight into the thing yep. and then pulling it back out the other end at 15% rather than... If they're over paying, 55 and, yeah. and if they're over 60... Which is what probably this yeah. lady over here should be trying to do. Yeah, that's right, because uh, you, you can access your super once you've hit 55 yep. uh, and obviously you have the minimal tax effects. Once you've hit 60 and yep. effectively retired, then it's 0%. You can take out... Okay. 100% tax free, plus okay. any earnings in your super fund are going to be tax yep. free as well. And we have one more question. Uh, if you have a beneficiary that's, a, say, my wife's mum and dad over, overseas, what rate are they taxed at as an overseas rate? Is that at 37%? It's a non-resident, it's a, yeah, it's a non-resident tax rate. The first, um, first 29,000 is getting taxed at um, 30% on every dollar. So you don't get any tax-free thresholds. You don't get the 15% marginal rate. And then it, then it scales up to the normal marginal rates. If you don't get time to, to speak with me, obviously there are some cards at the back there. Um, so feel free to take one, and I'm more than happy to help you where I can. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Darren.